Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the final lecture in my series on um, antimicrobials and antibiotics. I hope it's been bearable so far. It's been quite odd for me doing it in this YouTube format rather than the traditional lecture theatre. So the last part, the last really 23 slides or so, we're going to look at um, going beyond traditional small, small molecule antibiotics. Um, we'll look at a variety of different uh, systems. Um, and this is a fast moving area and to some extent we're um, what I'm doing here is already out of date. Things are moving quickly. I'm happy that this is the case. We should all be happy if this is the case. Um, but there's just some there's some pointers really to think about for the future um, and to give you just a flavour of where things might be going. So the first thing really is to say at this stage is to is remind you um, what you already know. Most antibiotics are derived originally from natural species. They may then be chemically modified um, Essentially, most uh, antimicrobials have come about by observation um, of, for example, the action of, uh, in this case, penicillium fungus on um, on bacteria. And we see the zone of inhibition here. This is actually, a, um, I think, a picture taken from Alexander Fleming's uh, lab book. OK, and you can do these simple and elegant experiments to show that one microbial species, in this case, penicillium, We'll inhibit another one in this case, um, probably Staphylococcus aureus, by the look of things. Um, and this has created a, um, a lot of interest in looking at alternatives to, if you like, for the traditional small molecule antibiotics. And of course, at heart, it's likely that it will be a small molecule action will do the actual killing. But there's a lot of interest in trying to um, look more broadly at sources of um, antimicrobial materials. Um, and this is this page here is just to show you some of the some of the uh, alternatives which are actually made it as far as clinical trials. So to get a, an alternative um, or to get any drug to clinical trial requires a lot of effort and quite some money. So um, of course it doesesn't mean it will actually be successful, but it is a uh, is is still an interesting um, uh, gives a picture of, of what may work out. Um, Bears interested in, for example, using antibodies uh, to uh, um, label bacterial virulence factors um, to make them less uh, uh, less toxic. Probiotics, um, particularly for um, uh, gut pathogens like Clostridium difficile, we'll come on to this in, in, in a moment. Um, there's some interest in here. Lysins are, um, are, sm are small peptides secreted by viruses which live on bacteria, which uh, can um, be effective at killing bacteria. Bacteriophage we talk about, um, and indeed wild type and engineered, are viruses which actually live off bacteria um, and can kill them. Immune therapy is um, interesting not only in cancer, I'm sure you've learned about uh, immunotherapeutics in, uh, in cancer chemotherapy, it's a huge and exciting area. Um, and um, there's also interest in trying to create uh, vaccines for bacterial infections, uh, of which there aren't that many. Where there's one or two bacterial infections um, which have effective vaccines, but still not some common clinical pathogens like Staphylococcus aureus. And then vaccines themselves, of course, which are an example of uh, an immune modulating device. Um, and finally, a uh, few other areas are antimicrobial peptides. The idea is you make small molecule peptides that have very good antimicrobial efficacy. Peptides are normally easy to synthesize um, and fairly cheap to synthesize. It's, got, it's quite an exciting area. Um, and then other kinds of peptides which can be involved in uh, um, immunity or anti have antibiofilm action. So let's first talk about bacteriophages. This is an area that I worked in about 10 years ago, but quite interesting. These are viruses. Um, which only live on bacteria, so they don't infect us. Um, but like um, COVID-19, like normal viruses, they require hosts in which to replicate and, and grow. They are semi-living, you might say, where they contain DNA, but they can't live without the host. Um, most bacteriophages have a protein capsid that contains either DNA or in some cases RNA. Um, some have this kind of collar and sheath, and some have a kind of base plate this base plate is important, tail fibers are important because these recognize the target bacterial cell wall and allow the, uh, the virus to land on the 
cell wall surface, on the bacterial cell wall surface, a bit like a kind of lunar lander, you know, Apollo 11. Um, two types known as virulent and temperate. Um, we'll come to what these, this means in a moment. Um, the genome, of course, encodes information for replication, so that genome there, packs in all the information that um, it needs to make copies of itself. And as in, as in all viruses, phage come into the um, target bacteria, target cell, and utilize the, uh, the ribosomal, the ribosome that's there to make copies of itself, of its um, protein subunits, and to copy itself. And they multiply inside the bacterial host. And most phages tend to be fairly target specific. They, they don't tend to get broad range phages. Phages tend to target a particular species, even a particular strain. But you can use phages in cocktails if you want to have multiple uh, uh, multiple targets. Um, but basically, life cycle is this. Um, what we're left here is it's broadly what happens. This is an electron micrograph. That's the cell wall. Let's get a pen here. So this is the bacterial cell wall. What you see here in black, I just mark it out here in red. Here's our phage, lunar lander, and it's injecting. Um, here you see it's injecting DNA inside the cell. It's quite remarkable micrographs, really. So it's absorption, injection. And inside here, you can see these little baby phages. So inside already, short time after DNA injection, um, the ribosome bacteria is churning out copies of the proteins required to make new phages. And these little baby phages are coming around here. And eventually, the, the, um, uh, the baby phages secrete um, a molecule called a lysin, which breaks open, which lyses open the, the cell from the inside out, a bit like a uh, the alien in, a, in aliens, or indeed alien, um, and um, the bacteria comes out and kills the host at the same time. But you can go from one, in principle, one uh, dose, one virus can reproduce itself, perhaps hundreds of thousands of copies within a single cell, potentially. Uh, looking here now, this is, the, this is the basic cycle. So this is attachment. So that absorption attachment is what we see here. The virus, you see a little guy here, attaches to the cell wall. Here goes the DNA in a little plasmid here, but then uh, utilizes the bacterial ribosome to make copies of itself, and then it packs and makes the baby phages that we see here, and then lysis happens. This is via um, phage lysins, and the phages escape out, killing the host, and they can go around and reinfect. It's a self amplifying system, which is rather neat. One concern, I have to say, um, so these are lytic phages, one concern are so called temperate phages. Um, which can undergo lysogeny. And here the problem can be that certain phages can inject DNA in, and instead of the DNA making copies of itself, the DNA gets incorporated into the target cell chromosome that you see here. And then um, this is a way that bacteria can actually acquire new genomic material. And it's believed, for example, that MRSA, the methicillin resistance strain of Staphylococcus aureus, acquired its, uh, its um, uh, MEC A, uh, a gene cassette, which confers resistance via phage, uh, um, via phage um, um, infection and a lysogenic cycle. Uh, now, if you talk to the people in the phage community, they will tell you that it's very easy to identify which phages go this way, which is what this is good, so you write a tick, happy days, and which phages will undergo lysogeny this way. And um, I'm always a little bit sceptical. I, I, I think that this is always going to be a concern for re regulators, but how can you absolutely guarantee that you get the lytic cycle and not the lysogenic cycle? That, that is um, about to worry. And I think the problem in terms of getting phages for use uh, clinically is going, to be, is, is going to be reassuring the regulators that your virus here, which might have a genome of that's millions of different uh, of millions of different bases. That's hundreds of thousands of different genes. Absolutely doesn't contain any genetic information that could be harmful to uh, the host um, animal by uh, entrance uh, from uh, the uh, by, for example, uh, um, lysogeny. In this case, we see here. If we want to avoid this kind of phage infection um, and a lysogenic loop. Now, of course. Viruses are used in uh, uh, in medicine. Uh, some vaccines actually are um, viruses or, or attenuated viruses, but there is a kind of move away from using viruses um, for vaccines because of a concern um, that in some cases you can get reactivation. Um, but 
it should also be said that um, there are some um, there are some clinical cases now where phage have been used. There is um, uh, a law in the United States that in um, certain kind of last uh, ditch cases with patients who have raging infections who are basically not uh, not going to survive, and every antibiotic on them has been tried, you are allowed to try um, experimental therapies such as bacteriophage. There have been some case reports, but not proper clinical studies showing um, effect. So this is an area to watch out for. It may yet develop into something big, um, but for now I am I, I, I'm optimistic, but I'm also cautious. This is then a, the, the, this is uh, when I, I worked with a phage, a small phage company a few years ago, and of course they were extremely pro bacteriophage. So this is a rather partial view of why the phages are so good. You have high strain specificity, so you don't affect normal flora, unlike anti many antibiotics. They obviously, as we said, they self-replicate, which means you need a low initial dose, which in principle is good. The antibiotics, as we know, have an admi scheme and metabolized when eliminated. Um, it's claimed no serious side effects, but that's really the jury's still out on that one. That said, phage are probably the most uh, numerous uh, living system that in on Earth. There are um, I think 10 to 15 phages, um, but there's more phage body than anything else living on Earth. So we are exposed to phage all the time. Um, antibodies can cause side effects, as we know. Um, you can get resistance in phage uh, or in bacteria against phage, but in principle, these bacteria should be resistant, should be susceptible to other phages. Uh, discovering new phages is in principle rapid. A good source of phages is where there's lots of bacteria. So you get wastewater, sewage, to me and you. That's a good hunting ground for uh, for bacteria because phages will like to live close by their host um, and clearly sewage is full of bacteria and therefore it's also full of um, full of phage. It's a fairly straightforward um, um, even an undergraduate experiment to actually identify uh, the plaques from sewage water. You take sewage water, filter up bacteria and you add it to uh, uh, lawns of bacteria and you look where you get plaques. These plaques are where bacteria hasn't grown because it's been killed by viruses. Um, so this development process is in principle fairly cheap um, and simple. There's some interesting recent work going on about trying to make a completely genetically modified uh, a, a, um, bacteriophage which has no natural DNA in it whatsoever. It's, it's built from scratch. Um, this is by a, a very good scientist called Martha Clokey at Best University. Um, and rationale here being that right, here you know exactly what's gone into your system. Um, there, there's no doubt that you've got uh, potential pathogenic genes because you don't um, you don't allow them in the beginning, which is quite a clever idea. Um, but we will see. And this is what they look like. Uh, quite easy to um, become in various kind of shapes and flavours. The general families are Cypheviridae, Myviridae's, um, Myviridae's. This kind of shape here. You see here the capsid head here, and there's the tail, and there's the uh, there's the kind of base plate down there. Um, some smaller than others. Um, typically about 100, perhaps 100 nanometer long tail fibers. Now, capsid head is perhaps 20, 30 nanometers across. They do come in, yeah, they do come in different, um, in, in different sort of shapes and sizes. These are just some of, of the viruses, of the phages that we discovered ourselves many years ago. Please do not worry about these classifications here. It's not important. It's just a, from an old talk I gave. But very easy to get structured information using transmission electron microscopy, which is what you see here. Uh, moving on now to bactericins. Um, bactericins are bactericidal antibiotic-like substances. They're, they're proteinaceous in nature, um, they're produced by bacteria, and generally they've evolved uh, because bacteria are often very keen to kill other bacteria of different species. Um, bacteria in any place will be competing for resources and space. Um, for example, a wound, most wounds are initially colonized by Staphylococcus aureus, um, and that grows fine, um, maybe not for the host, but for the for bacteria, the Staphylococcus aureus is happy. Um, and then later comes along the ground negative bacteria, Pseudomonas. And you can actually see, we've done experiments ourselves, where you can actually, um, where Pseudomonas will secrete molecules that kill Staphylococcus aureus. Um, and we do it because they want to, uh, they are competing for the same resource. Um, so this is quite, an, this is quite a, a, an interesting approach, is to try and identify what these molecules are, these bacteria sins, and see if they actually um, might have clinical um, efficacy. And in fact, these was first discovered back in 1925, 
um, when uh, um, an E. coli uh, species um, showed activity against other strains of E. coli. So this is not even species on species, this is strain on strain um, action. So bacteria since tend to have a fairly narrow inhibitory spectrum, as you might imagine. Um, they are, are, as I already said, biologically active proteins. They tend to be bactericidal rather than bacteriostatic, and they recognize cell receptors on the target bacteria surface. Um, and the things which make the bacteria sin are not generally contained within the, uh, the, the bacterial genome, but are instead in a plasmid, that's a small loop of DNA, which um, often tends, is, is generally kind of free floating within the cytoplasm, but not associated with a chromosome. Which means in principle, they can be, um, they can be readily uh, uh, transferred, transfected from one bacteria to another. In a way, the same way that we saw with these resistance elements, for example, the NDM1, in principle, bacteria seems um, virulent elements can also be transferred um, across strains and even across species in principle. Various kinds of bacteria seems out there, um, and I, I don't have time or the energy to do this perhaps uh, uh, justice, but if you're interested, have a read of this. This is a nice Nature of Views microbiology from 2005, a little bit out of date. But broadly, back then, there's probably more now, there were three classes. So about the so-called uh, Nissins, the Sacosin, and the Lysostaphins. Um, the Lysostaphins, this is, if you look, obviously, this is a, um, uh, this would be a, probably a gram-positive bacteria. And you see here, Lysostaphin breaks down the peptoglycan layer. It um, appears to chomp up the peptoglycan directly, which obviously then damages the cells. It's directly bactericidal. The class one Nissins appear to go through the peptoglycan membrane, but instead interact with the phospholipid bilayer um, close by the cytoplasm. And likewise, the class two uh, bacteria sins similarly go through, but form some kind of uh, macromolecular ensembles within the lipid bilayer that you see here. And all doing so uh, basically render the, 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 uh, the target bacteria dead, which is what you're after. Um, I'm not uh, completely aware how much, uh, how many of these bacteria have actually reached um, it to uh, clinical use. I think they've been used in clinical trials, but I'm not um, aware, but this may just may be my ignorance of their, of, of commercial um, uh, production of these yet. But I think, again, it's an interesting area that I wanted you to be aware of. Um, and then this is fairly recently, this is from 2015, this is a, a um, this is big news um, in early 2015, um, long before COVID-19, that um, uh, a US group had discovered a whole new class of antibiotic. Um, and what they had done was they had started looking at soil living bacteria. And this is a, an interesting approach. Um, there are thousands, if not tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of undiscovered bacteria that live in the soil. So it's a very rich biological matrix. And we know very little really about what goes on there. So these guys, this group in the US, decided to go prospecting for um, interesting bacteria that live in soil and try and find out if they um, could find some bacteria that um, were uh, effective at killing other bacteria and then identifying what the actual what the actual molecule that was doing this was. And they did some digging and they found a bacteria called um, Alpharia teres. I think I pronounced that wrong. Um, and what this soil living bacteria does, it lives happily in there, is it secretes a molecule called tyxobactin. You can read all about this here in Nature. I mean, I've got some, I've got some um, clips from that paper on the next few slides. So it's a, com a complex structure. You'll note immediately, of course, it does not follow the, uh, it does not follow Lipinski's rules of five, not remotely. Uh, too big, too many hydrogen um, bond receptors, too many hydrogen bond donors. Um, but it's very, very active. Um, and again, this is interesting. Perhaps you may not be interested in this molecule itself, but if you're developing a new antibiotic, these are the kind of experiments you really want to want to do. And let's, let's quickly look through the first this table here first. And um, it's got the MIC, the minimal inhibition concentration of this uh, of this molecule, 
against, here we are, that's 20 different um, targets, uh, strains, target species, I should say, strains of species. Um, Staphylococcus aureus, gram positive, Enterococcus, also gram positive, Streptococcus pneumoniae, um, but also um, Clostridium difficile, a gut living anaerobe, um, uh, Haemophilus, uh, gram negatives like E. coli, also gram negatives like Pseudomonas and Klebsiella. So, a broad range of, well, not, it has to be said it's not particularly good against Pseudomonas or Klebsiella. Um, but look at some of these MICs. These are, in fact, these are fantastic MICs, 0.25 microgram per mil. This is a very, very powerful antibiotic. You don't need much of this to, uh, to, uh, to, to have a useful effect. Then over here, we can look at some uh, comparison measurements they made against oxycillin and vancomycin and a control, which is just bacteria that went along and did its usual thing. This is um, early stage bacterial growth. So this is a, about a log six, uh, at six, roughly six CFU per mil bacteria. Um, normal growth goes up and it's in stationary phase, but all of these antibiotics had a very similar kind of kill profile. However, if you then add bacteria later on in the, in the cycle, bacteria, static bacteria tend to be less effective at the late stage at, in the exponential phase because the bacteria are growing rapidly. Um, you already got a lot of bacteria around. Um, and so the challenge at, for example, eight, um, at, at log eight, um, at, at the 10 to the eight CFU per mil is, is, is more difficult. And you can see here that vancomycin is not looking particularly brilliant. Oxycillin is still looking good. So actually the activity of tigerbactin and oxycillin is broadly similar. Here in, in part C is interesting. This cloudiness tells you about the, the kind of uh, the um, concentration of bacteria, um, broadly speaking. What we see when you add tigerbactin, you clear, you actually get lysis um, in, in um, almost in front of your eyes. And I think they actually have the video where you actually pipette it in and the bacterial situation clears. So you can see it's directly bactericidal. It's not just relying on bacterial growth, it will come in and it will kill bacteria as it goes. And vancomycin, oxycillin control, um, you, they attenuate growth, vancomycin and oxycillin, but not particularly bactericidal. Um, the final bit is, 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 is complex to explain. I don't, I don't want to kind of lose you in, in the detail here, but one, of, but one of the things you should look at is how quickly you can induce a, a target bacteria to evolve resistance. And this is a, a way of doing an accelerated evolution experiment by uh, repetitive passages of stronger of strong bacteria. You, um, you effectively um, inoculate your target bacteria with just about the minimal inhibition free concentration of, of your target molecule. And so you aim to kill 99% or 1% survives. And they have strong guys and every day you you passage that through, you grow that up and you, you kind of, uh, you basically you can uh, massively increase its resistance. So this is over 25 days. You see with ophloxus in here, you get a rapid, you get almost a, a 200 fold increase in MIC against ophloxacin by doing these serial passaging experiments. So basically the target bacteria here rapidly uh, evolves resistance, whereas that doesn't seem to be the case of tigerbactin, where the MIC stays happily down, right down at um, sub one microgram per mil concentrations. Anyway, you can read all about it here in Nature and download it from the university if you are um, interested. Uh, mode of action is complex, and please do not get lost in this. Uh, there's some complex biochemistry here, but broadly speaking, it's believed that uh, the um, uh, what Tycobactin done is it interferes with the cell membrane. Um, so it's a cell membrane acting molecule, and it appears to um, act on the inner lipid membrane. So that's your peptidoglycan. In a gram positive, you see out here, passes through there and is a, um, interferes with the synthesis of the peptidoglycan building blocks. That synthesis happens within the inner membrane via the uh, movement of various com uh, sugar components around which are assembled, then flipped through the membrane. So these individual um, components here, which are carried on lipid one and lipid two, uh, come together to form a peptidoglycan structure that flips across like so and then goes to form nice new peptidoglycan. So what's believed to happen is the tycobactin um, interferes with this uh, assembly process, with this, synth with this synthetic process of, of lipid two um, 
uh, into a new peptidoglycan and a lipid free. Um, but it is pretty. Uh, it's a pretty complex. Uh, it's a pretty complex uh, study. I've. What's impressive is that they, the people who wrote this paper, were able to um, delve down and understand the, the molecular level of of um, action of tycobactin at this level of detail. That's really quite impressive. But do have a read of a paper uh, reference on the last slide if this is um, if you want more information. OK, now moving on to talk about the gut microbiome. Um, and this is this is an area that's that's, that's becoming more and more um, of interest. Um, the kind of classical view of microbiology was that microbes are bad, bacteria are bad, and we want to try and eliminate them. If we could, if we could have a, a sterile environment, then we all be happier and live better. But that's a slightly naive perspective. Um, uh, we are numerically as many uh, uh, we have an almost equal number of bacteria within us as we do non-bacterial cells. The issue, of course, is that bacteria are much smaller than normal eukaryotic, um, eukary eukaryotic cells, um, and so they don't take us up as much space. But certainly, between your uh, uh, for your gut is basically full of bacteria, um, uh, Lactobacilli, Streptococci, um, and then lower down um, in the lower bowel, of course, you have the Enterobacter, Enterococcus, Salis. Um, and lots of other uh, kind of, if you like, the, the poo bacteria, you might call them down here. OK. Um, and you see, as you go down through the stomach, um, you, you basically the bacterial loading goes up. And of course, your poo is primarily bacteria, if you ever examine it too much, um, in detail. But interestingly, um, prenatally, we are essentially sterile. Um, we have a few bacteria within us, um, but we acquire our so-called microbiome, that is, the bacteria that we live with um, pretty much at birth uh, from your mother's vagina. You also get a good, normally good uh, coating of your mother's poo as you're born at the same time. Um, and this generally is a good thing um, in most cases, uh, depending as long as it's not going to be streptococcus, which could be harmful. But most bacteria um, can, um, from a mother are, are um, uh, useful to get going your own uh, microbiome as a, as a baby, as you see here. Um, so they pick up bacteria on their skin, uh, they inhale bacteria through their, through their mouth, so um, before they even take a breath, their mouth and nose are absolutely full of bacteria, and then bacteria come into their lungs, into their, into their gut. Um, and uh, um, that's uh, basically how we start to acquire our biome. And there's, um, it's very important that we do rapidly acquire a um, a, a complex microbiome, and there's evidence that the more different kinds of bacterial species that live within us, the healthier we are. There's also evidence, increasingly, that the gut bacteria within us control um, can affect many other diseases, everything from depression through to a range of autoimmune diseases. And there's lots of interest in potentially trying to uh, uh, look at modulating gut bacteria to make us. Uh, 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 to as a way of combating disease, and in fact, we look at an example of this in a short moment. In a short moment. So, as I said, we are almost half bacteria numerically, um, and the gut has a, a rather uh, sensitive ecology. Um, there's many different species of bacteria, many different strains, um, and in general, that's what we need. Bacteria there; they help break down um, our food, uh, and they, um, yeah, are really part of of, of how we live. But difficulty is if you have if you're on long term antibiotic therapy, as some people are, you can end up killing or severely disrupting um, the good gut bacteria you, you have within you. Um, and it can allow uh, pathogenic ones, which are largely um, antibiotic resistant, such as Clostridium difficile, to take over. And this change in gut micro microecology is also thought to be important in, in um, some unpleasant diseases like Crohn's disease or cystic colitis. Um, and, and, um, in fact, more and more uh, diseases seem to be uh, discovered every day, which may be associated with our gut microecology, our, our, our gut microbiology. OK. Right. So let's talk about Clos Clostridium difficile. Um, it's a, uh, a bacteria you don't hear that much about, which is in a way odd, because it kills an awful lot of people. Um, it should be said it probably mainly kills old people, which is perhaps why we're less concerned. Um, this is from 2011, the CDC in the US estimated there's about half a million infections per year. 
um, and there were roughly 30,000 associated deaths. I'm not sure what the current data is. Um, C. diff you cannot kill with alcohol hand gel. It actually likes alcohol. You put it in alcohol, it goes into a spore type shape and sits there quite happily until the alcohol goes away and comes out and starts growing again. Um, so that's uh, uh, the alcohol hand gels we're all using at the moment are not very good against C. diff. Soap water is, however, effective. Um, it's, an, it's a gram positive anaerobe, which means it doesn't like oxygen. And in fact, its name, difficile, comes from the fact that it was very hard to culture. And until people figured out it was an anaerobe, you had to grow it in low oxygen conditions. It was really difficult for people to grow. It lives in the gut. Um, hopefully, uh, you don't have much of it in your gut. Um, if it is there, it should be kept in control by other bacteria. But you also find your skin, your water, soil, etc. Um, and again, the issue with, with, with C. diff is that if you only have um, a small amount, it doesn't cause you any harm. But if you remove all the other control bacteria but keep it in check, um, the C. diff spores, this is for sp they tend to live in a spore state, these are kind of fairly inert, uh, metabolically inactive <coughs> capsules of bacteria. They create a kind of protein coat around them, they come out of their spore formation um, and start growing. I think it's happy days. Um, at which point um, they start to uh, colonize the gut and then they start to secrete toxins which destroy the gut lining. And these, these very unpleasant lumps, if this is looking inside someone's gut, a diseased uh, gut, these are lumps of pus, um, which is really a bit grim to think about it. And this is inside a very unfortunate person's um, uh, gut. And this is called pseudomembranous colitis. You do not want to get pseudomembranous colitis. It's not a good day out at all. And this is in a cartoon of a, of, of a kind of thing you'd see in the gut of someone with C. diff. And quite often, uh, it'd be only uh, until recently, the only surgical intervention to C. diff infection would be to actually remove bits of disease of disease gut, of disease, disease colon, depending where, where it's located, um, and then obviously replacing that with a with, with a stoma bag, which again is not ideal. So there's recently an interest in the idea, coming back to this idea, back, almost back to almost the idea we saw with bacteria sins, of using good bacteria to fight bad bacteria. In this case, bad, a bad bacteria being Clostridium difficile, good bacteria being healthy gut flora, normally from a donor. So you, obviously, if you have Clostridium, your good ba gut bacteria has pretty much gone. But you would um, uh, you'd go along to your local poo bank um, or, or um, these do actually exist, um, and you would s select a sample of uh, of donated uh, fecal material, and that is what you think it is. That is actually a, a poo suspension, and you basically shove it up you or, or down you. You can um, get it into you via um, enema form, where you shove it up your bum, or via an NG tube uh, down into the upper part of your um, intestine through your stomach. And I, I think the choice of uh, administration would, would depend really where the, the infection is thought to be. There's some, there's some kind of um, more references here you can read about if you're interested. So does it work? Now, one of the things I want to do want to kind of introduce and in the email I recently sent to you, I, I gave you a, a clinical paper, is to start to understand how we can measure effect of new antimicrobials in terms of clinical studies. And actually clinical studies are really the only way you can know whether a potential antibiotic or antimicrobial does what it's meant to do. You can do lots and lots of lab work where you look at um, bacterial killing, but until you transfer it into um, uh, a, a human patient, you don't actually know whether it's safe and effective. Okay, so this is looking at now I think roughly 20 odd different studies of, of, C, of CDI, which is C. diff infection, or C. diff infection in studies. They all had C. diff infection. Um, now, be careful when looking at clinical trials. Um, a lot of them are very, very, very badly done. Um, basically, any time you see a single patient, just reject it. That's a case observation, um, and 100% resolution means that patient uh, appeared to get better from the uh, from the uh, from the treatment. But really, uh, the numbers are just far too small to be meaningful. Um, and as a broad rule of thumb, you really want to look at studies with hundreds of patients. Um, all these studies are, are really pilot studies. They're either case studies, one or two patients, or they're small pilots, so perhaps 18 patients there, 45 there. And I've just selected here, highlighted two of the larger studies, it's still a bit small, 
um, but appear to show effects. So this is now um, 45 patient study, and it appeared that 97.7 percent of the patients would be what 44 out of 45 uh, were, uh, were the C diff infection was resolved. Um, mean age shown there, um, and you can see here it was given by a rectal catheter, so actually got a bum in that case. Okay. Um, and then the donor relationship to the patient um, is showing there. I'm not actually sure what that means. And they're given between one and three infusions. And then the, the store where we're given the fecal material given there, you can see the volume and um, how many grams per, per, per mil there. Okay. Um, and you see another example down here. This is a this is 90, just about making out 98.5% resolution rate. Okay. And you can see here that was different ways of administration by colon colonoscope. Uh, NJ tube is a, um, a tube through the stomach into the um, top of the uh, uh, upper intestine um, uh, enema and so on and so on. And so, on. so it's just interesting to look um, at this data. Um, and in general, when looking um, at historical evidence of antibiotic effect, it's best not to look at single clinical studies. So don't look at any of these individual references, but look at meta-analysis of clinical studies. It's always a good thing to do. A meta-analysis where someone has gone along and have analysed critically um, perhaps dozens, even hundreds of separate clinical studies. They've rejected ones like these small ones here. They don't have any statistical uh, um, um, meaning. They've rejected studies that perhaps don't have uh, controls. Uh, they've looked um, and they, so they, they look at the, the properly done studies and then try and evaluate whether there's evidence of effect or not. The Cochrane Library, C-O-C-H-R-A-N-E Library, uh, you can look this up, have lots and lots of these meta-analysis meta -analysis studies. So I would, um, if you're bored one day, have a look at the Cochrane Library. How does it work, um, fecal bacteria therapy? It's not really properly understood. Um, it's for lactobacilli. These are these, uh, if you like these good bacteria that live, uh, uh, which are acid, tend to be acid secreting, acid living bacteria. Uh, the lactobacilli are a component of uh, these uh, rather unpleasant drinks you can buy. Uh, names escape me, but they advertise a lot on, te on television. Also, uh, bifidobacteria, um, non pathogenic cocci, gram negative pathogens, gram positive pathogens. Um, so what's obviously we don't want these guys. We want to prevent these guys attaching via these. Um, and lactobacilli are found on many parts of the body. They tend to live in the vagina, um, and they're responsible for keeping the pH low, which keep, uh, makes it a, a, um, a an environment where other bacteria don't want to invade. And it's thought that lactobacilli may be actively involved in um, uh, in the clinical effect in in fecal bacteria therapy. So different ideas of what might be going on. Uh, Co-aggregation, so they, they co-aggregate with pathogens, that's the blue guy and red guy, uh, preventing ingress. They might secrete surfactants that basically kind of solubilize the bad guys and off they go. Uh, it's believed they might produce hydrogen peroxide, which can, or bacteria since can directly kill the bad guys, involved in signaling cascades or exclusion or indeed direct immunomodulation. Um, and in the gut, uh, membrane there's also a lot of interest in the in the, the junctions between the gut cells and how that can be uh, uh, it's, it's believed that these 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 gap junctions um, are one of the ways that bacteria can be pathogenic in the gut and uh, it's thought that perhaps lactobacilli for example can prevent these gut uh, junctions being opened up so these are just ideas I'm not sure if it's entirely understood at the moment but have a read of the reference here So, final thoughts. Um, the war against infectious diseases is probably unwinnable, um, but that depends how you define winning. We, all, we have to live with bacteria. Um, bacteria will always develop resistance, whatever you throw at them. Um, what are the solutions? Um, in my view, we should be using antibiotics less. Um, we certainly shouldn't be using so much in agriculture. I, I, think, I think agriculture or use of antibiotics for factory farming is actually elephant in the room that we don't want to confront because it allows us to have cheap foods and cheap meat and cheap milk, but actually it's a disaster. Um, but should only be used for really ill people, but should be used for viruses, of course. 
description use must be tightly controlled. Okay, I think that's the final slide. I hope you've enjoyed this part of the course. It's come at a, a weird time with uh, the current COVID-19 uh, um, um, pandemic. Uh, obviously, I'm not talking about viral infections here at all, but a lot of uh, kind of the broader kind of public health issues about microbial disease um, applies much to kind of viral infections as to bacteria. Uh, the only issues from a chemical perspective, antivirals have a very different way of uh, mode of operation and, uh, um, and, and structure. And I've not talked about antivirals here at all. Right. Uh, good luck with the final exam. Do not worry about it. I've given you some hints already. Do some reading around um, and uh, enjoy the rest of the course. Oh, here I should say some final thoughts. But well, you can move up for yourself there. These are just, uh, um, uh, just, uh, yeah, some thoughts about the future. But you can have your own.